Commerce Tools is known for its headless commerce approach. Can you explain what this means and why it's become crucial for businesses to, you know, in, in today's digital landscape? What we described with the approach um, early on um, was to solve a problem that more and more companies ran into as the environment started to change more and more quickly to them. So uh, brands today need to make changes to their customer experience multiple times a day, either because of their consumers request something, because they have new marketing ideas, because there's uh, challenges from competitors in the market and they want to um, stay ahead. So you need to up-level your game constantly on a daily basis. But in past technology, that became tricky. Welcome to the EU Startups Podcast. Sit back and enjoy the show hosted by Marcin Lewandowski. This episode of EU Startups Podcast is brought to you by Vanta. Are you building a business? Achieving compliance with frameworks like ISO 27001 and SOC 2 can help you win bigger deals, enter new markets, and deepen trust with customers. But this can also cost you real time and money. Vanta automates up to 90% of the work for the most in-demand frameworks, helping businesses get compliant quickly. And with over 300 integrations, you can easily monitor and secure the tools your businesses rely on. Join over 7,000 fast-growing companies that use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. To learn more about how Vanta works and to get 20% off, visit vanta.com slash EU startups. That's vanta.com slash EU startups. Now, kick back and enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. This is Marcin Lewandowski, and you're listening to the EU Startups podcast. My guest today is Dirk Horig, the co-founder and CEO of Commerce Tools. Dirk is a creator of headless commerce and pioneer with cloud software in the enterprise market. Commerce Tools provides the most flexibility and scalability commerce platform, enabling hundreds of brands and retailers to create commerce possibilities that had not been possible before. Um, everyone, give it up for Dirk, Dirk Horik. Um, Love to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Looking forward to the conversation. Amazing. Uh, Dirk, so you've been a tribalizer in the e-commerce space, moving from SaaS to PaaS. Uh, what inspired this transition and how has it reshaped the way brands approach e-commerce? So when we started Commerce Tools, we've basically seen um, a change in the market um, for, for more than 10 years. right? So I, I, I would call the beginning of e-commerce the year 95 probably so 94 95 uh, was when internet adoption started to increase we saw more and more web stores company like amazon um, started uh, to come up and then companies thought about don't we need a software to enable um, us to, to sell something online mm -hmm. and that was for more than almost 15 years um, stayed stayed the same. And then in 2007, the iPhone came to market. Uh, mobile internet penetration started to increase. Uh, two years later, the iPad came to the market. And we believe that we will see a fundamental shift in society where we come from one device which had been a clunky computer in your household with a huge monitor um, that also occupied a lot of space. Um, th this moved a little bit to laptops, but then we got mobile devices, um, smartphones increased, and we believe that the internet will be everywhere. Um, new applications are coming out um, and shopping, therefore, will look different. And the solutions that we built before to enable these web shops now need to provide something that, that we call unified, unified shopping experience. No matter what touch points comes up, if it might be voice, in the car, in the store, wherever, um, we needed a different approach. And this e-commerce everywhere um, was then the inspiration where we thought, okay, we might need to rethink enterprise software again from scratch to mm -hmm. reflect that change in the market and the impact that it will have to brands, retailers, uh, and manufacturers to respond to that. Awesome. Um, Dirk, so as the co-founder of Commerce Tools, uh, you know, what, what was the vision you had when you started the company and how has that vision evolved over time? Yeah, so the, the first idea was to provide um, a core commerce platform, a core commerce engine out of the cloud mm -hmm. that can 
enable e-commerce everywhere, right? So, and therefore, the first years, the focus had been on building out this platform yeah. um, and and making that or giving giving customers the opportunity to launch um, outstanding shopping experiences on that. If we look at commerce tools today, um, and as we had been been growing um, significantly over the last ten years, um, it now became. Uh, beyond the platform business, um, a multi-product offering. So today we are giving companies all of the components that they can build and run shopping experiences yeah. on any device and touch point. Might it be B2C, uh, B2B, B2C to C, uh, B2B to C, um, with a lot of automotive brands that are doing in commerce in the car. You can upgrade mm-hmm. the car while you're driving. So it expanded to a multi-product offering um, yeah. from this at the beginning more narrowed um, core platform idea. Awesome. And um, Commerce Tools is known for its headless commerce approach. Can you explain what this means and why it's become crucial for businesses to, you know, in, in today's digital landscape? Yeah, and, and the setless it, it might be misleading um, because the hat in technology uh, was described just as the visual layer. So what you see when you visit a website or when you open an app. Um, so basically the buttons and and uh, nice images uh, and the functionality then is the body. What we described with the approach um, early on um, was to solve a problem that more and more companies ran into as the environment started to change more and more quickly to them. So uh, yeah. brands today need to make changes to their customer experience multiple times a day, either because of their consumers request something, because they have new marketing ideas, because there's a challenges from competitors in the market and they want to um, stay ahead. So you need to up-level your game constantly on a daily basis. Right. But in past technology, that became tricky because the solutions that we built 20 years ago to um, launch commerce sites did not have the requirement that you had to change anything. So from 2000 to 2007, you did not need to make any technical change um, on on your website. Um, and and now suddenly we're living in a world where nobody knows what is the device of the future anymore, right? So will the yeah. Apple Vision Pro be the thing where we all buy things in five years or not, not five years, in five months, or maybe not, or is there some other device coming out? So you need to respond fast. And let me give one quick example here that, that I often um, like to use. A few years ago, Best Buy, so US online retailer, um, one of the largest in the world, um, mm-hmm. uh, in the top 10 of online retail um, in the US market. So Best Buy, wanted to move the add to cart button a few pixels um, because their internal design agency said if you do that it will likely increase the conversion rate um, a little bit and that's a very small change so for everybody who's listening here who has a rough understanding of HTML and CSS you would say oh well after a cup of coffee I'm done with that so call me in an hour and I have done that change it took Best Buy nine months included more than 60 people full time cost them more than one and a half million um, it's all publicly documented. Um, the CTO brought a book uh, out about this whole uh, scenario. Um, but the, that was all the good news. The bad news was they could not have made any other change to their website at the same time. And we talk here about one of the largest e com sites in the world with right. hundreds of engineers, well-skilled. The problem was that the system that they had been built and extended over 15 years became so complex and nobody could make a change anymore. They had 250 mm-hmm. different versions of the product detail page, no testing environment anymore, and so on. Um, and why was that? Um, when it had been implemented, the idea was not that you make changes on a daily basis, but then Best Buy, the, the, the world moved forward. Yeah. Now things are constantly changing. You needed to adapt. So what we developed our company for was giving companies the agility and flexibility and scalability that they can make these changes quickly. If you need a mm-hmm. boat today, then you can build a boat. If the boat should become a train, then you can make it a train. If it needs to be a plane, you can make it a plane. So having it working like Lego blocks um, and as, as what, what, what we could not have foreseen is that the world even becomes more fast pacing and volatile. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody, because of COVID and so on, and other um, in, in a different context, has heard about resilience, building resilience. We actually created commerce tools in our platform for business resilience because the only way how you can have resilience is that you are flexible to adapt to environmental changes. And in that case, environmental changes to to the economic market, to the consumer behavior, to the buying behavior, to technologies. And we want to give them that toolkit that uh, makes their 
digital business future proof. Right. And that's what Headless on the approach is basically solving. Nice. Thank you for this masterclass, Dirk. Uh, actually, commerce tools, you know, it sounds like the Swiss army knife of e commerce. Yep. Uh, offering incredible flexibility and scalability. Um, you've worked with a diverse range of clients from SMEs to global players like ATT, uh, Lululemon, and BMW. What are the challenges you've observed among these clients, and, and how does Commerce Tools tailor its solutions to address their needs? Yeah. So, at first, I have to say that literally every company that we have worked with and that I've seen over the last years, um, they, they all identified their challenges, right? So, often from a consumer perspective, we wonder about, okay, why is company A or company B not doing this? This is so obvious, right? So, when you talk uh -huh. to them, they also know that it's obvious, right? So, why why, why is this door not allowing click and collect? Why, why do I need to wait so long in line um, uh, at the POS counter? Why is the loading page on my website so long? So, it's not that they don't know about that. They just realized um, because of just the pace of change um, that everything that they've built over the years, it's not so easy to change. Um, and everybody who's working in a larger organization knows that A, you have the people change management process um, that you need to take care of, but often there are legacy systems running that are 30, 40 years old that can be a backbone of specific functionality. So it's easier for some startups um, or younger companies to implement changes um, than mm -hmm. for um, successful long-term companies and the, the the overall challenges that we that we see today we, we always categorize them in, in three buckets and um, the first one is flexibility and flexibility can mean hey, we need to make so many changes on our website um, it's outdated consumers are uh, maybe complaining uh, often, often so the, the intent here is to increase conversion rate um, it's very expensive to attract new customers so uh, you would like to incentivize them to come more often to your site and buy again for that you need to implement specific um, functionalities um, and that might take too much time and this mm -hmm. is this is adding up um, or you want to launch a new business model you think about okay maybe I need to reinvent my company for uh, the next century um, let's not just do what we have done the last hundred years and digitalize it. Let's now come up yeah. with new ideas. Um, that, and so that's adding up. And that's what I mean with flexibility. So they have a lot of ideas, um, but technology is hindering them on rolling things out quickly. And yeah. I don't know, I w don't want to, to name large uh, enterprise uh, uh, players here. Uh, I think everybody knows them. Mm -hmm. It's not, they hadn't been built that your own team can make changes there. Often you need to learn a specific programming language, a specific framework. The onboarding time for internal people often can be up to a year until they can be really productive. Um, and we, we all know that talent is hard to find these these days. Um, so we, we try to, to develop something that is programming language agnostic um, that can be onboarded within a few days where everybody can make changes on the technical layer quickly, right? So Amazon is doing a change every second second. We want all our customers to be able to operate like Amazon, right? So then they can define, mm -hmm. does it need to be every second second or is maybe four times a day enough? Mm -hmm. But, and I can tell you, for most companies, even those that are doing four, five, six billion on revenue, yeah. they even do hard on making one change a year um, on the systems that they have. So I just had been at visiting a couple of companies in, in, uh, on the East Coast uh, last week, and it, it's always the same pain point. The second pain point is scalability. And scalability... Um, we often think about, okay, there's these big events like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, then you have these mm -hmm. high traffic peaks. And yes, that's true. For that, you need to prepare. And uh, having a true cloud platform that has the underlying elasticity from the hyperscalers um, that we are using allows to scale up and down seamlessly. Um, even even when there's surprise traffic uh, coming to the platform, sometimes not every event is being planned and, and you, you might have more traffic than you expected. But the bigger challenge often for companies these days is that they've been growing maybe from 300 million to 500 million online, or at least the category of enterprise players that, that we are serving. Yeah. And 
that's not so easy for them to scale anymore. Um, and because it's not just on, oh, let's buy a larger database or let's book a couple of servers on AWS or GCP. Um, mm. It often requires them to make technical changes to the existing software. Um, and as we provide a true cloud native product, we help them to overcome that scalability topic. And then the last and, and, and uh, probably most shocking part is often up to 70% of the IT department budget just goes on keeping the lights on. It's on maintenance, it's on upgrades, it's on versioning. Um, mm -hmm. And when you think about that, you could freeze some of these costs, yeah. uh, that this could go to innovation and right. help on providing better customer experience, um, doing some of these things that you all the time wanted to do, that your customers are asking for, um, would also significantly help them. And it's so a lot of these kind of things, but at the end, I would say it comes always down to these three segments. Crazy. Um, generally, uh, you know, with a background in developing and launching online service, uh, y you've seen the e-commerce space evolve drastically. Like, what are some of the biggest changes you've witnessed? And, and you know, how has e-commerce tools adapted to stay agile? And uh, actually, yeah, you were talking about it a bit more, you know, agile in response to emerging trends and customers' demands. Yeah. I think the, the biggest change overall, I would say that we all as shoppers are significantly more enabled and digitally mm -hmm. educated um, today yeah. than the digital shopper 20 years ago. Uh, yeah. And and you, you can see, I would say all of us, when we go to a store, and I not mean when we just randomly want to have inspirational shopping um, or walking through the streets, but for example, if, if you know, hey, I need a new TV for my house, um, yeah. all of us are probably better informed than the store associate is yeah, um, yeah. wherever you walk to because you have all of the information just within your hand, right? So you, you, you can access, you, you get comparisons, you can watch product videos and so on. So the, the, the buyer today is significantly more impatient, educated and demanding than ever before. And potentially the young people that are now, I don't know, 10, 15 years old, when they are 25, they will be significantly more enabled than the generation today uh, right, even right. is just because of the access on information. That, But that puts a lot of challenges to the companies out there because they are not growing and developing as fast as the individual is that is just now growing up with generative AI natively um, and will demand complete different things in, in five to six years where companies are not yet even even prepared for. So I think that's yeah. that's the biggest change if we, we look back. From a technology perspective, um, I think the, the one, one, one point that I already mentioned was the pass from, oh, we are desktop PCs in the office and maybe at home. And now everybody has a computer either on their wrist, right? So even, even the smart watches that we have are more powerful than most desktop PCs that we had been using 20 years ago. Um, and that change on the device world, um, plus the infrastructure development. So from on-premise servers that you needed to host yourself to mm -hmm. um, managed hosting, cloud, and then the evolution of cloud to um, mm -hmm. the hyperscalers today um, had been the, I would say, fundamental enablement layer um, to make a lot of things these things possible that we're using today. Derek, um, you know, as a seasoned entrepreneur, you've weathered the storms of startup life. Um, your entrepreneurial journey began uh, in 2002 when you started your first company out of university. So, you know, what are, what were some of the, or what are some of the most valuable lessons you learned during these years? And um, what's one piece of advice you wish you could go back to and, you know, uh, give yourself when you were just starting out? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear from you if that overlaps um, with other answers that you get uh, to that question uh, from, from other entrepreneurs. Um, the, the most valuable lesson, and I also think one of the most important skill sets um, from my perspective is not giving up. Um, mm. And it, it's at least also what, what I hear um, across uh, successful founders. And with successful founders, I don't mean, hey, I, I built a company and I've been lucky I could sell it after two years, right? So these mm -hmm. stories also exist, but it's not reflecting 
the majority of successful outcomes. If we look at the Nasdaq, if we look at, I don't know, um, the, 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 the companies that became big over the last 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. um, all of them had multiple near-death experiences. And, and, and all of them had scenarios where nobody wanted to fund them, where, where customers did not pay, where things did not work out, um, where just, yeah, uh, things went south unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's significantly harder um, uh, than, than expected because it's a marathon that you have to run at a sprint um, speed, <laughs> I would say, uh, to a certain extent. Um, mm. And building, building, building large companies often takes more than 10 years of time. And you have ups and downs and constantly ups and downs uh, where you wonder, hey, why am I actually doing it? Right. So um, why, why, why I'm not just now, I don't know, go surfing to the beach or w whatever I would like to do. Yeah. Um, uh, is it is it really worth it? And this not giving up in these kind of moments and saying, oh, OK, we're getting this done. It's definitely um, probably the most critical path or, or experience um, that, that you need to go through for at least long term, long term success. And that's maybe also the the advice i'm not sure if it's advice or feedback right so having the confidence that most likely it will all get well right so it will not get well on its It'll own so right. you just cannot rest and you, you will be all right uh mm -hmm. it's it's it will be tough yes it will be annoying um but a there are more people than you think that also went through mm -hmm. that because from the outside it always looks easy because you just see the success part right so yeah. you, you you see in, in in sports uh somebody winning but you're not uh seeing when this person was getting up every day in the morning at 5 a.m yeah. and had been training uh, eight hours and had i don't know bleeding knees and so on so that's that's a part that you don't see to get there you just see that kind of snapshot and the overlap um, from from my perspective, is, is um, so there, there is a big big group um, that that suffered and went through the same. So uh, nobody is alone on that path. Though you still need to walk alone <laughs> on getting yeah. there, but there are enough peers to connect to, and that's maybe the advice on you, you will be all right uh, in most cases. Um, it's just a little bit tougher than you might have expected. Mm. Actually, it does overlap with uh, other people's answers, other entrepreneurs' answers. Like one of the answers that was really cool and stuck with me that I recently heard uh, from one of the entrepreneurs I was interviewing mm -hmm. was that um, so she ran a marathon uh, in New York some years ago. And then she realized that, you know, if you keep going, not giving up and just put one foot ahead of other, you will finish the marathon uh, sooner or later. So you just got to keep going. You can't, um, you know, yep. you shouldn't give up and uh, yeah. It's all about kind of perseverance and this um, this drive that actually. And of course, you need to hire a lot of great people. Of course, you 100%. need to figure out product market fit. So there are a lot of things that you have to do. But at the end, the tricky part is not. So as you said, it's one step after another. You cannot walk all of these ten thousand steps uh, within one second. Mm -hmm. um, and there will be steps that are not so much fun and where, where it's easy to just break out. Um, Dirk, uh, let's switch gears for a moment and talk about downtime. How do you unwind like, and, and recharge outside of the office? Any hobbies or guilty pleasures you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, I, I think first, the, the, um, the, the most important part is family, right? Um, mm -hmm. So have uh, amazing, uh, <laughs> challenging, but fun uh, uh, three kids at home. And that's a good, good contrast, right? So with all of that traveling and with all of that CEO life and it's uh, like, so when, when I'm at home, I feel like I have nothing to say. So it's often a big kind of contrast <laughs> on running a global company right, right, right. and I don't know, being uh, negotiating a big customer contract. And then five minutes later is why is the dishwasher not done yet right so that's a, a similar uh, kind of life i think that we share all of us and but that puts things in a better perspective and contrast mm -hmm. and also let you switch topics quickly in your brain right so the, that 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 you don't carry the work um all of the time with you yeah. and the other thing is is sports right so might it be with the family uh, we're all pretty active uh, if it's water sports i don't know surfing or uh, being on the weekend just just on a boat uh, like 
mountain bike and um, played volleyball a long time now I'm, I'm getting getting a little bit old and it's becoming less um, but w- whatever yeah so all types of activities um, mostly outdoors um, lots of sports uh, and and spending time with a family um, yeah. is what uh, helps me to, to unwind and recharge uh, outside of work nice I can relate to that I have the same feeling like um, you know like at home especially with my daughter like I have no say over anything whatsoever she owns yeah. me like it's just follow whatever she wants whenever she says so yeah it's a funny thing um you know they say behind every successful ceo is a great support team or a support system um you know like who are the unsung heroes in, in your life or career journey like uh, and, and how have they helped shape uh, your path to success yeah yeah so what well- At first, of course, there's a lot of amazing colleagues always, right? So that are doing all of the work um, and uh, in a company. But when I look at it, I think this is what you mean with the question who, who probably outside um, of the core company team yeah. has been supported. Um, there was always in the phases of building, building a company had been people um, in there um, who engaged. Might it be that they invested early on and believed that they had uh, opened up contacts, that they help you winning the first customer on making you a introduction to um, their CEO um, and and for us it was if, if I would call out a few people that I have in mind um, the early days um, we had the former um, HP CEO uh, Wolfgang um, hey Wolfgang long, long time no speak um, not, not sure if you're listening uh, oh, who, who, who early on right so that uh, had been helping us with a lot of contacts out of his network uh, mm. Um, setting up the company, giving advice, uh, be, being a sounding board. Um, then, then little, little later on, um, once the business started to grow, um, uh, especially uh, uh, Robert um, and Chris, um, they, they are both uh, um, C-level executives um, at Rewe, so one of the largest German companies, uh, Grosser. Uh, those are still serving on my board, uh, actually, now mm-hmm. since... Uh, 10 years I think <laughs> this year's celebration is coming up as I'm thinking loud about that um, and uh, so 10 year anniversary uh, will be that they're serving on my board um, yeah. and had been tremendously helpful um, over the years and, and especially in the first years uh, where the business had been a small with small I mean uh, a million plus right so now no, right. it's a 150 million plus company but um, yeah. at, at that time believing in the business supporting us uh helping us with winning customers and so on um, and, and putting a lot of time and energy um, in there in the back um, and ever been there when we needed them um, but also left us uh, enough space to make our own errors uh, and, yeah. and mistakes I would say uh, so it's then definitely today um, also other board members um, I, I would say in the last years um, I, I see the company life in phases so there's a pre-revenue building the business then had been okay let's get from a million to, to 10, 20 million. Um, and, and then over the last years, as the company had been growing um, to where it is today, um, I don't know, I would say that all of my board, um, investors, shareholders, uh, always try to be helpful uh, when we need somebody or something, asking for an introduction, um, ask for a different perspective, um, especially Doug. Um, so to call him out here, um, had been helpful uh, on the go-to-market side on scaling the company globally, um, as he has done that uh, in, in various C-level roles, uh, both on private and public companies um, before in the US, um, uh, always always helpful. Um, and, uh, and last but not least, and I think this is maybe every company also needs these, mm-hmm. the first customers and partners who believe in you were, it's a chicken and egg uh, kind of issue, right? So nobody yeah. wants to be the first one. And as we're running their digital commerce business and most of their revenue then is enabled through us um, mm-hmm. you want it to work uh, because otherwise um, their business is in trouble and those who early on relied on us um, 
the the Carhartts, for example, is one of those customers that we are now working with since over 10 years on our platform mm-hmm. uh, successfully um, that, that came to us. So these early customers that doubled down and that also took a risk on saying, hey, no, we believe in the product. We believe in the company. Right. Um, it's early on. Uh, and as well as the the partner ecosystem around it, that you need to support it. Um, mm-hmm. That said, hey, no, we also invest into that business uh, and and build capabilities um, around it. Yeah. Um, th- that's the the probably unsung heroes, or that you don't see so so often. Um, right, right, right. That, there are that have over time to make yeah. it big. Yeah, there there are. It's well, we're we're now fourteen years in the market, right? So and yeah. takes time, different phases. And it's, yeah. of course, changing, right? So somebody who has, has been helping at the beginning is maybe not as helpful anymore today because they have a different kind of focus, but that um, makes them all similarly relevant because it's here, again, it's it's step by step um, yeah, yeah. And, and you need different people on the journey helping you. Cool. Uh, Dirk, we can't let you go without a fun question. Um, if you could trade places with anyone for a day, who would it be and why? Mm. I don't know. The obvious ones is like that. That everyone could say, "Oh, it must be amazing to have uh, one day in the life of Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk just to yeah. see uh, what what they are doing." Um, I still probably wouldn't pick it. I, I probably would honestly pick one of my kids because I would curious oh, to nice. see the world out of their days. Right. So, how is yeah. it in school? Second or third grade today? Uh, how is it uh, playing? I don't know soccer. Uh, or the sports that they're doing with the others. So it, it day, we, we are already so settled in the world and, and um, have put everything into a box and into a framework, uh, how yeah. we understand it. Yeah. But, but they, they see it fresh, right? So in having this fresh view again, um, yeah. out of their perspective, um, I think would probably what I would be most, most curious about. Great answer. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, I'd probably like, now. I think about it, I'd probably do the same. Like, I would love to see the world like with my daughter's eyes. It would be so. Cool. Yeah, and maybe it's also because, and and I'm I'm in now the lucky position that I'm able to meet a lot of people. So yeah. though I have not spent time with both Elon or Mark yet, but there are a lot of other very interesting people that you yeah. then get to know over time. And I also assume you, we have the podcast and other activities. So my feeling is that I'm getting having a good view of that size of the world now into uh, people who are running large companies and having a lot of impact. So it makes me less curious, but I w- think it's more interesting what you could learn and see um, with somebody who is just three, four, five, six years old. Um, okay. Amazing. Um, Derek, so to end it off, uh, what's the next, uh, what's next for commerce tools? Uh, can you give us a sneak peek into you know any upcoming innovations or initiatives uh, yeah, I can I can give a sneak peek um, on something where we're at the moment um, experimenting. Um, okay. uh, nothing yet that we're uh, fully announcing, um, but but that therefore that might be more uh, exciting. Uh-huh. We believe that it's also time to uh, revolutionize the in-store experience. Um, mm-hmm. From my perspective, it's broken. Uh, uh, as a shopper, a, I see that unified. Um, if, if I like a brand or a product, um, uh, I might buy it online. If there's a store around, uh, if I'm at the airport, they have a flagship store there. I just yeah. purchase this over there. Um, but I want to have a similar, and with similar, I mean seamlessly perfect working experience. And especially the POS is broken. Uh, It it might be different for everybody here, but if I go and buy something in the store, Mm -hmm. on average, my wait time at the POS is longer than the time that I need in the store. I'm also a very spontaneous and fast buyer. So if I know I want something, I just pick it out of the shelf and then I immediately run to the POS. I'm not spending much time and hanging out in the store. So I I think my my spend ratio is quite good related to the time spent uh, that that I have. Um, And it's still 20, 30 year old technology. None of us want to stand in line and wait just to pay, right? And uh, uh, then 
things are not working uh, or do you have an account with us then you need to give them your email then they try to sign this in then when you log in at home because you figure out who you want to return it you don't find it in your online account because the POS system and the e-commerce system is little, so it's not the same system and they haven't connected it so there are a lot of challenges and what we are at the moment investigating is how can we enable our enterprise customers with a unified experience that easier integrates into the POS and also takes, uh, we, we believe in a POS-less world where the store associate today is more like an e-commerce associate in the future. Um, and you can check out with everybody everywhere in the store um, and giving it a much better experience and um, not not having check out such a bad experience um, as it is today. So we're, we're investigating and investing also more into um, in-store capabilities uh, with our platform um, and tooling at the moment um, uh, to try to figure out uh, what is the best way um, we can help our customers um, to uplift the experience there. Awesome. Dirk, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation a lot. Um, yeah, all the best and um, I'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me here. Ciao.